Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii from the air. Go ahead, Honolulu. Everyone here on the islands were taken by surprise by the attack, and even yet it's difficult for some people to believe that our air raid on these... Now picture being rounded up and forced to live in a jail-like camp within your own country. Sounds pretty crazy, right? But in the 1940s, that's exactly what happened to Japanese Americans. So I've come to Jerome, Idaho, to the old Minidoka camp, which was one of 10 US government built camps meant to hold Japanese Americans during World War II. They were not soldiers of any kind. They were just Americans and they were plucked from their lives, their businesses, their jobs, their families. They were all forced to live in this jail-like camp. Barbed wire fences, armed guards, and guard towers around each corner. There is a lot left behind to see, so I felt like I would come here and give you a tour walking through the property to show you what it looked like here. This is the original guard shack to the camp. The foundation and its walls are still here. Very small in here. Now this outer part here also had a roof over it, so probably was a lot bigger than it seems now. And over here, now this used to be a waiting room where people used to sit and wait to visit people who were in this camp. Fairly small place for a camp that had thousands of people staying in there. So there are some active restoration projects going on here throughout the property. Uh, one of which is this reconstruction of this guard tower. Originally there were seven of these all around the huge property that made up the camp. And I can only imagine how scary it must have been being watched by armed guards from these towers. So if this was back in the 1940s, there would have been buildings all over here. The actual site was something like 33,000 acres, but most of the buildings were squeezed into like a 946 acre area. Now there are some buildings that remain, some that have been preserved, some that were removed and actually brought back at a later date. When they originally got here, there was nothing out here. It was just sagebrush and dust and dirt. And they transformed this land into actual farms where they could grow crops and make their own food. They were very resilient for being placed in confinement like this. So I believe this is one of two fire stations that were located inside the camp. That end right there is where the fire trucks were parked. So remembering that there was 33,000 acres here and thousands of, of people here, there was a lot of potential for fires. So it was good that they had two fire stations here. So this building here was one of many, many barracks that were throughout the camp and everything is all locked up but we can take a look inside and see what it looked like obviously it's in very different condition than it was back then
The next building here was the mess hall and it's pretty sizable as you can see. Just that basic wood with tar paper covering it. Look at that. It's hard to see in there, but it gives you an idea. This is the building, this is the barracks that we just walked by and it shows you how many there were just in this area. Minidoka became Idaho's seventh largest city called Hunt after its postal designation with a peak population of 9,397 internees here. By 1944, the camp operated much like a small, sufficient city, powered by the sweat and ingenuity of the Japanese Americans confined here. The camp grew much of its own food, had a 196-bed hospital, an internal police force, a library, two elementary schools, a junior high school, and a high school with 1,225 students. They had barber shops, watch repair shops, fish markets, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, movies, art exhibitions. They truly made it as normal as they possibly could here. So down below me is a recreation of what once was a baseball field. Baseball was very popular and a sense of normalcy. And um, they took it very seriously. It was a way to take a break from being incarcerated like this. And they got pretty into it. In fact, even teams from outside of the gates, from outside of this camp, would come and, and, and compete and play games with them. So it was very important for them and uh, pretty nice that they recreated this so we can see what it looked like. So this area behind me was once all farms. In fact, some of it still is. These Japanese Americans transformed these dusty, useless fields into productive farmlands. In fact, they were really dependent on themselves to make their own food. This huge root cellar up ahead here is what stored all that food. So this root cellar was very vital for the winter and throughout the year. In 1943, internee farmers produced 979,000 pounds of potatoes, 79,000 pounds of carrots, and 101,000 pounds of cabbage. All cold storage crops were stored here until it was needed. I can show you from the side here. That's a good look in there now. You can see the construction of it. Quite sizable inside. Coming up on the swimming hole, this is it. Wow. So this swimming hole was dug because the summers were so hot here in Idaho. Really amazing to see what it looked like. So one of the reasons why they dug this swimming hole is because back in 1943, two young boys were swimming in the river or the canal, whatever is right here, and they actually drowned. So this provided a much safer environment and a much needed break from the heat and the boredom of this internment camp. So the picture that is online actually lines up somewhere right in here. You can actually see that's one of the information signs right there. This is it. It's almost like a heart shape from this angle. The information sign here says, this popular spot measured 20 feet wide by 200 feet long and five to nine feet deep. Camp children learned to swim here. Adults enjoyed being near the water. One of few camp landscape features to remind them of home. 
It's really hard to imagine people walking around in here, kids playing, people working, eating, playing baseball. I mean, this was an entire gigantic community. In fact, they got so used to living here that when the war ended and the government said they had to leave, most did, but some refused and were actually forced to leave shortly after that. I mean, you have to think about that they lived here. I mean, this was, it became their home. They were uprooted from their normal lives and forced to live here. So it makes sense that some of them definitely felt that the U.S. government owed them something more than just saying, sorry about this, you're out of here. So it was interesting to find the swimming hole. I didn't know I was gonna be able to find it, but it's clearly marked. So if you come out here, you will be able to see all the different places that I just took you to for yourself. In fact, since it is an ongoing restoration site, in a few years, there may be even more to see, but the history definitely never changes. Uh, it's definitely a, a dark part of our American history here. But I uh, hope you liked it. Um, I feel like a lot of people maybe didn't even know about this, so maybe I brought that to your attention and uh, maybe you learned something new today. I know I definitely did. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.